All right, guys, thanks so much for listening to another episode of the CX Chronicles podcast. Super excited. We have Tony Sternberg from Prosperg Stack joining us today. Tony, why don't you say hello to the CX Nation, my friend? Yeah, hey, thanks for having me, Adrian. And uh, yeah, really excited to be here um, and just kind of talk about some, uh, some different CX stuff. I love it, man. Well, look, you've got a uh, guy. So, so Tony and his team are building an awesome uh, an awesome product, an awesome solution over a Prosper Stack, and he's going to tell us all about it today. So, Tony, why don't you just set the stage, man? Um, before yeah. we even get into the four pillars and all that fun stuff, spend a couple yeah. of minutes just talking about how did you get into this whole world? Before Even pre-Prosper pro, uh, Prosper Stack, how did you even get into the world of thinking about wanting to have the gall to go build a business or build a team or build a solution that uh, was going to be able to help a bunch of customers out in the future? How did you get into this whole land? Yeah, for sure. You know, I love I love that kind of question because it just cuts deeper into just what does Prosper Stack do now, right? But yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it all it all kind of started for me. You know, after college, I, I ended up starting at a SaaS company in like 2007. So, you know, I feel like an ancient SaaS person at this point, but you know, it doesn't sound too bad. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, I joined a startup. It's one of the first few employees, and you know, throughout that process, wearing a lot of different hats, but got exposure to that world and just knew I loved it. Um, so, you know, from the get go, it was, you know, doing customer support, doing product testing when the developers push a new feature to then as we grew the company, just getting more defined roles in product management, in operations and things like that. So, you know, from 2007 to 2019, I, that, that's where I was and, and I ended up, you know, running day to day operations as the president of that company and, you know, learned, you know, as, as you're growing that company, you have a lot of kind of um, issues that you run across, right? So we always looked at churn. We, we, we acquired customers in like a free trial model, right? They come to the website, put their credit card in, try it out. We don't really talk to them. It was just that sort of model. But on the other side of the funnel, we, we always had a problem where we just really didn't understand why our customers left, didn't have a good grasp on it. We couldn't really talk to them because everything was automated. So, um, you know, as different technologies popped up, you know, Stripes of the world, all these billing management platforms with, you know, really cool APIs and things that you can build products with, we just looked at it as an opportunity um, you know, myself and my co-founder who I worked with at that company for about 10 years. Um, and he's the CTO. So he's the technical arm of, of what we're doing today. And we just kind of looked at that as an opportunity to say like, Hey, how, I think this is the pain point that we had and we can address for other companies. And, um, ultimately we just want to help them understand why their customers are leaving, um, collect that feedback, provide that data platform for them, and then ultimately leverage that data and feedback and, and see what, if we can correct that issue in real time in an automated way and then present maybe an offer and an incentive to that customer so they don't churn out. And uh, we found that you can be quite successful doing that. So that's what led us to today. So that's awesome, man. Number, number one, I just think, um, man, there, it's, it's, I know I say this a lot, but there's, there's so many different walks of, of customer focused business leadership um, backgrounds and mm -hmm. journeys and just the stepping stones to, how yeah. everybody kind of arrives at it. I think you though, you had a lucky one, man. You got to build a business. You were part of building a business, building a team, building a customer portfolio. You got to see the good that goes along with that, the bad that goes along with that, the, the freaking really, really hard stuff that goes along yeah, with getting a no company out of the book. Call what it is, man. <laughs> and I think like you you just said something that immediately jumps off, jumps out at me, which I think is so important for the listeners to think about, which is like a lot of people who start companies, it's their first one. It's their first, it's their first business. It's their first team. It's the first time they've ever even thought about what it's like to go out and get a bunch of customers using your product or using your surface or using your information, whatever it is, that you, whatever type of business you're in. And, and Tony, you're right, man. Most people, well, let's call it what it is. I would say 90% of people that have the goal to go build a business, they're optimists. Mm -hmm. They think that everything in the world mm -hmm. is going to be phenomenal and everything's going to work and everything's going to sure. we'll figure it all out. They probably don't, be, they're not thinking about churn or retention or churn mitigation going into their business planning they're thinking about mm -hmm. they're, they're they're thinking about the dollar dollar bills that they're going to stack up right yeah but like yeah, yeah i love that you guys immediately you know knew that there was going to be a whole world of optimization solutioning technology to help business owners and to help these different business leaders and executive teams with this because it's hard man and frankly mm -hmm. it, it takes a lot of companies either um, a, a many, many years of evolution and growth, or it takes till they get to the point where they have the funds or the resources to go hire some really experienced people who kind of know how to think about this world. They know how to, how to build a playbook around it. They know how to combat churn. They know how to think about all of the ways that you can mitigate consternation so that employees have a, a frictionless experience. So super, super cool thing that you yeah. guys got into. Um, 
how did you get the business started, man? T- t- take them before we even get into team, take a minute or two. To, how did you sort of come up with the initial idea or the initial technology or the initial solutions that you were going to go to market with to get people excited about helping to reduce their churn? Yeah, um, this really kind of dials back to kind of when the COVID wave hit at first. So it was, uh, we, we basically formed the company in April of 2020. Um, okay. <laughs> plans, were, plans were in motion. There was no going back, right? Like it, it was, man. It, it was, it was like, hey, we might as well, might as well yeah. um, do this. But what an interesting thing happened around that time too is, is that, you know, I know from just SaaS people in SaaS businesses that I know is that customers, as soon as COVID hit, the, you know, panicked, right? They, yeah. they dialed yeah. back all their spending, all their subscriptions were getting canceled like crazy, like crazy. Yeah. And, and throughout that, that period, it almost like, it almost validated our strategy and what we were doing because had the, these companies had a solution in place like Prosper Stack, something that could have, whether we just temporarily pause that subscription, giving them a temporary discount, just having that, you know, understanding of your customer that, Hey, this might be a hard time for you right now. We'll, we're, we're here with you to get you through it. And we're, and we're willing to do whatever it takes to retain your business. Um, because you know that's that's really the core the core metrics that you're looking at are our churn LTV and and that's the the metrics that we're helping each business improve. So um, throughout that process, as we were building it, all this is kind of happening and going on, and we were able to launch that summer. And in a big stick, you know, a lot of the interest we got at the time was like, wow, I really wish I would have had this in place two months ago when we lost you know 22 percent of our of our revenue um, due to churn. Now I think totally. luckily everyone kind of recovered from that in, in a relatively quick fashion um, and things were going up and up by the end of that year. But I think that was something really interesting that happened at the time we were building it for sure. I love it, man. And, and, and it's funny. I hear what you just said right there. I feel like I'm saying this more and more and more in these episodes, which is mm-hmm. wish there was a solution like this on the last yeah. four or five companies before CX Chronicles, because you're right. Yeah. But that's, that's the awesome part of the world that we live in, man, is like there's different entrepreneurial people and different experienced professionals out there who get to see things maybe on company A and they spend a few years kind of understanding that whole world. And then it's what leads to these types of solutions. It's what's it's what leads to tomorrow's companies that, you know, people go out and build. So I love it. Um, I'd love for you to dive into the first CX pillar, Tony, let's talk about the team. Yeah. Let's talk about the team that you're building over at Prosper Stack and, 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 and give the listeners some ideas around how did you think about getting that initial group of people together to even get this bad boy off the ground and to figure out, I mean, as I mean, you were talking about earlier, but like, yeah. these things are hard, man. These things are super hard to build. Um, any business is really difficult to manage or to lead or to, or to own and to, to operate. How did you get your initial squad together to kind of get Prosper Stack off the ground and start getting some of those first customers in the door? Yeah. Um, you know, we're, you know, still a relatively young company just coming up in a couple of years now. So it, it's been, um, you know, we've been fortunate enough to hire, you know, several people and we're really, you know, happy and, and proud of, of what we're doing. Um, but yeah, when, when we started looking at that, number one was like the core founding team, you know, like who, who do you want to go and do this with? And are those people, um, you know, complementing your, you know, your weaknesses or, or what you're not as strong at. Right. So everyone's got their different strengths. So that was kind of the first thing. And like I'd mentioned in my intro, like I'd worked, you know, together with, um, Graham, who is the co-founder here and, and the CTO for a long time. And, um, he's the technical branch of the company and, and someone I, I knew I trusted and did really good work that I'd want to, you know, kind of go into this venture with, because without the right partner on that side, this, this would be, you know, DOA, right. It yeah, wouldn't even yeah. be worth it. Yeah. Other than that, you know, we, we're, we're a B2B SaaS company. So we, um, our first few hires are on the sales and business development side. Um, so we looked at how we wanted to, um, you know, hire that. And, and honestly, we didn't, I didn't have a lot of experience doing direct outbound sales, um, you know, at first in, in my previous life, in, in my previous SaaS life, because everything was so kind of automated and transactional. So it was a difference, it was a different approach that we were taking at Prosper Stack. And that initial approach was built out, you know, by my, essentially by myself and the help of my co-founder and, and developing that process and system. So once we had something that was working, we wanted to scale that out. And um, when I looked to hire the, the team early, I leaned on, you know, my, my network, my prior established relationships with people, people I've worked with um, yep. mostly yep. prior. Um, and what's great is that you kind of know what you're going to get, you know, where their skill sets at, it's but more importantly, you just know their attitude, right? Like, you know, that they can work in a dynamic, fast paced environment that's going to change from day to day because this is working today, but maybe it's not tomorrow. Yep. Um, so we were big on leaning on those relationships for the early, first early couple of hires, um, uh, whether it was an intro from someone I knew or it was someone that I had worked with direct, directly. And that's kind of where the approach we've taken thus far, for sure. 
I love it, man. Awesome. First of all, awesome advice, Tony, because I think mm-hmm. you know, for some of our listeners, man, when you're building these businesses, you're growing these, 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 these companies, you're scaling these teams. Um, number one, like there's a number of different paths. There's not a perfect solution. I, it's, I feel like I, I'm constantly talking to people, well, Adrian, what's the best way to do it? And it's like, the reality is it depends on your industry, depends on your business, depends on your product, your service, mm-hmm. depends on your, your, your own appetite. If you're the business owner, what do you want to do? It's your business. That's why you started a company was you have flexibility and you have the ability to make decisions based on how you're going to kind of steer your ship through, through, through the, yeah. through the seas. Right. But there's something that you just said that I, I completely echo. And I love that you call it out nothing is better. There's two, two parts to this. Sorry. Number one, working with folks that you've already known that you've already had successful outcomes with mm-hmm. is absolutely critical because you just get to save so much time, so much energy, so much stress. And when you work well with somebody, just because you worked really well with them on company A, there's a really good probability that when you two individuals go and work on company B together, you're going to get the same types of results. It's, it's human Definitely. connectivity. It's the, it's the, 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 just the chemistry of how humans uh, either get along great or don't get along so well. And, and it's important to pay attention to that. The other big thing that you kind of mentioned too, that I, I think I've been hearing more and more um, startup executives and growth focused company business leaders talking about. And I think personally, Tony, what I'm about to say, I think it's a product of the pandemic, but more people are open to fractional leadership. And I think it's like on one mm-hmm. hand, there's this idea or sorry, pr- fractional leadership and fractional contributions is how I should say it. Because whether it's BDR work or whether it's marketing work or whether it's back in customer support or banging out tickets or whether it's um, some of the things that our, our, our friends on the product side, the tech side have to be thinking about when they're building and coding. The reality is the world is so connected now that it's easy to actually find mm-hmm. fractional capacity for every one of the things that we just talked about. And I think it's um, something that you don't hear enough people talking about. And I think that up and coming, you know, tomorrow's entrepreneurs and tomorrow's business builders they should know that that's an open path and they should know that that's a good path. And especially if you're doing a blend, Tony, where mm-hmm. one part of it is people you know and you trust, the other part of it is uh, individuals who can just get you it done and they're good at what they do and they're sneeze in their space. That's a really, really nice uh, formula for success, man. So I'm, I'm glad that yeah. you called that one out. Absolutely. And I'd echo that that emergence of the fractional model as well, because like I could just, I just know from the outreach I get uh, that I'm getting more and more and more you know, whether it's a fractional CFO or something like that, that wants to work in the business. And, and quite honestly, when you're at a stage, early stage company, that, that model can make a lot of sense. And it's it not something I had seen a few years ago, but now I'm seeing it a lot. And, I, uh, it's, it yeah. makes so much sense. I, I mean, a big part of, of why we started CS Chronicles was because we knew that. I think, you know, just for, to give the listeners ideas, if you have a full-time uh, CX or CS individual, or sorry, executive or, or, or leader that costs anywhere from 150 to $200,000 a year, plus benefits, plus equity, plus Mm -hmm. management opportunity costs, because somebody's got to help lead those individuals and or show them a compass, right? What's north, what's south, what's west. Most executives don't actually have the bandwidth to be able to effectively consume or support or, 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 or work hand in hand with those people. So pandemic has showed us a lot of different things. I think the other thing too, is I just think the pandemic has showed how there's almost a benefit to individuals that get to work in a variety of different circles instead of one singular corporate culture or one singular business. Yeah. There's, a, there's almost like a, uh, the ability to kind of spin off ideas or sort of, you already know what kind of works in one area. Maybe you can test it in another area and see if you get the same results. It's almost like an efficiency thing, but I think that you're going to see that whole path and that whole strategy continue to become more and more acceptable, especially with, with up and coming business leaders of tomorrow. I think you're absolutely right on that for sure. Um, Tony, I'd love to jump into the second CX pillar tools, man. I'm, I'm excited to talk with us about, mm-hmm. uh, about you, but I'd love for you to spend a couple of minutes talking about two things. Number one, we definitely want to hear about the Prosper Stack tool. Let the listeners know yep. exactly sort of how the technology and the tool works and sort of some of the things that you're already doing with some of your customers. But then I would love for you to spend mm-hmm. a couple of minutes talking about like, what are the tools that you and the team needed to actually pull together to build Prosper Stack, to make it a, a living, breathing business that's growing right now? Definitely. Um, so yeah, from the Prosper Stack end, um, what what's great is is the way it works is we leverage um, you know subscription companies that are already on a billing platform like a Stripe, like a Chargebee, Chargeify, Recurly, etc., and we integrate directly with those platforms. So it makes integration setup for our customers very easy. It's just like a few lines of code you drop in, hook it up to your cancel button, and then it calls the Prosper Stack experience. And what's great is when we're connected into the billing platform, now we can take a lot of actions on your behalf. We can leverage customer data and help them segment their customers out that lives in that platform. 
Um, and then as we as they go through that offboarding experience, we gather that feedback and data. Let's say that ultimately they do cancel because you know a good percentage of people are still going to going to cancel. Um, we can we can process that for you on your behalf, or better yet, when we save them with an offer incentive, we can now apply that offer and incentive directly to their subscription. So it makes the management of the entire process. It takes it out of what's traditionally in the developer's hands, like oh, I need to code up a form. I got to make this change. Oh, marketing now wants me to say this instead of that. And it puts it in that marketer's hands, in that customer success person's hands, in that growth person's hands, and lets them control it with, within our app and, and then push changes live that don't require any more co code or development work on, on their end. So it's hugely beneficial from, from that perspective. So, and then provides really just a data platform to, to learn and, and dissect that information in a useful way, um, instead of just throwing it like a, in an email inbox or on a spreadsheet where it just kind of sits there and you don't do anything with it. So that's from the prosperous act side, that's, that's really, um, what we what we do and how it works and, and some of the value out of it. But I'm happy to talk, talk about some of the other tools that we're using internally just to grow and scale our business too. So um, from that end, uh, CRM, Cora, what we're doing, obviously we're B2B and we're, we're doing some outreach. Uh, we are a HubSpot team. Okay. Um, you, you know, you got as a startup, you got to love those HubSpot early discounts. <laughs> now, <laughs> now the, the one thing I'll say is they do end. So be careful about that. Yeah, right, and, right. And, and their stuff is very well gated. So, you know, we, we start using HubSpot. We're like, this is great. It's working awesome. Now it's like, oh, I wish we could do some automated sequencing while well, that's up in their, you know, in their sales package. Now we want to do some CTAs while well, that's in their marketing package. So pretty soon the cost gets high, but honestly, it's, it's a great product. I've always kind of admired HubSpot from a distance. Um, I like their design. I like their kind of way about doing things. They have a lot of expertise out there in the market on their blogs and stuff like that. Totally. Um, and their product is good. So um, we use it uh, religiously every day and it's really core CRM what we do. Um, some <clears throat> some other things we use in conjunction with that, um, Seamless uh, for data enrichment. Okay. So when we, we're, we're very intentional about who we reach out to. We're, we don't, we're not the kind of company that sends 200 emails a day per rep and hopes we get a couple of replies back. We actually do a very high touch model. So when we want to make sure that the data um, that we're getting for the people we want to reach out to is high quality. And we found Seamless has been the best so far. We've tried a bunch of different ones. Um, they're, they're a pretty good company, um, great company. Um, and then we use Loom, uh, Loom for awesome. our video pitches. Yeah. And yeah. Um, just again, the theme is hyper-personalized. We, we're not reaching out to a ton of people. We're very intentional about it. So we put a lot of effort into our outreach and, and our reps, myself included, will you know, make personalized videos for everyone that we email. So um, that's a that's a big tool in our in our tool belt. Um, uh, other than that, like communication wise, we we use Slack like most companies do uh, internally. It's great for us. We're a remote. I would say we're a remote first company. We do have a, an office that we can use, but uh, we we plan as we scale to to be a remote first company at this point in time. And Slack is great for that. We also use it for shared channels with our clients. So oh, it's nice it's, on our higher end package. We can we can do that. Yep. Um, and then uh, segments, another tool that I love just because it allows us to pipe, you know, data usage, uh, customer information into it, and then really get it into different systems um, and, and to really just putting it into one place. And then it integrates with so many different areas that you can pot, pass it into like, you know, your email tool, if you want to, you know, help influence who's getting the emails uh, there in your, in your CRM, or even into our app directly, because we, we actually integrate with Seamless directly too. So those are some of the tools that we're using to help grow and scale process stack as well. I, I love it, man. So number one, Tony, thank you for sharing that with us. It's super helpful. Yeah. Um, I think this is, I, I'm, it's becoming one of my favorite parts of these episodes is just hearing how different companies and different teams and different leaders have thought about the expansion of their toolkits and their tool and their mm -hmm. tool stacks. But here's the other thing. Um, what a lot of folks sometimes forget or they don't think about, this is an expensive part of a modern business, like building Definitely. out your tool stack and everything that you just went through, HubSpot is a prime example. I love HubSpot too. We're building, we're building CXC on HubSpot as well because it's awesome. It's 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 everything that you said. Easy simplicity. There is it increases visibility. It's capturing all of the activities that you're doing in the real world. You can bring them into a place where then you can number one just like continue to think about how you optimize growth and how you find other people to go work with and work mm -hmm. for. But then the other part of it too is just sharing all of the great things or all the not so great things that are happening within a business across your team. Um, I am very much going through the same type of process currently where as you get better and better at using it and you start getting deeper and deeper into other facets of HubSpot, mm -hmm. you start to realize very quickly, oh, wait a minute, I need, okay, I need, I need to, I need to up level. Yeah. Well, here's one thing I was going to say when you were saying that, you know what I was thinking? I was thinking, man, Tony, some of the well-funded venture capital backed startups that I worked, worked with in New York City, fine, we might've used Salesforce, but then we also had 
how many Salesforce engineers, how many sales ops managers, yeah. how many different architects had to be able to be a part of building an ecosystem that allowed 25, 50, 100 different sales folks or CS folks to be able to use the CRM. So with, with that being said, some of the stuff that we're seeing with HubSpot, it's a breeze, man. It's a walk in the park. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I wanted to call it real quick too was um, just the, the, the loom piece. I think that this mm -hmm. is super, super interesting because you said something that is just so spot on, which is for some of our customers that are, or sorry, some of our listeners today, when you're thinking about building your customer portfolio and you're thinking about growing your customer portfolio, if you've got one of the one of the types of companies where you're building an incredible business that can be not only be a, a big business, but can be a really sustainable business, but you don't have a large number of customers, man, you just nailed it, Tony, the personalized approach, the high touch approach. Yeah. And you leveraging a tool like Loom where Tony and Adrian could literally be face-to-face -face about a, a quick exchange or a quick conversation. Mm -hmm. Talk about personalized, number one, that's fantastic. But number two, that's like, I would argue companies that can't do this because they have 100,000 customers make sense to me. It makes sense. 100,000 mm -hmm. loom videos yeah. is probably really hard and really expensive. If you're the type of company that's built an incredible book of business with 10, 50, 100 different accounts or, 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 or customers, now you're talking about something that is like a really great way of being a differenti mm -hmm. differentiated way of personalizing the experience, high touch, face to face, also as best as we can, even though we're still in this weird pandemic world, but like coming off the back end of it, but like this stuff's going to stick, man, this stuff's going to stick. So like, I, I wouldn't be surprised if some of tomorrow's leading companies continue to take these types of activities straight into the future post pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And, and <clears throat> how we kind of stumbled across that strategy that ended up working for us too is, you know, and I'm sure you're, you're pitched a lot, Adrian, I'm sure like, you know, your, your leadership position, same here in my past, you know, you're, you're sold to a lot and you get a lot of out, outbound outreach and you can tell what's, what's generic and what's templated and what's yeah. not. Big and time. it's like, and if you're just a name, if you're just Adrian on that inbox, then it's hard to get the, the space and, and the time for anyone. But yep. when they click that email and they see, you know, a, a, a gif of your recording and they're like, oh, this is personal to me, I think. Yeah. I'm going to check that out. Now, Adrian's not just a name, he's a person. And that's like the first thing to overcome. And they're at least going to give you the time of day. And if they're not, they're generally like, you know, this is amazing outreach and I really appreciate the effort. It's just not for us right now. That's fine too. But um, yep. yeah, yep. it's, I think these, these strategies and tools are here to stay, no doubt. I, I Guys, I was telling Tony, um, I was telling Tony last week when we were catching up prepping for the show, I said, most of these times when I get some of these loom videos or these vidyard videos yeah. to Tony's yep. point, people are trying to pitch in, I think like nine out of 10 times, I, I might, I'm not, I might not opt in and say yes to the sales exchange, but I will literally say like the video, nice job, not interested, but best of luck. It, it at least warrants yeah. a response because you yeah. right, and somebody's like, they're taking the minute to not just sit there and craft an email, but they're taking the minute, whether it's even just a scan of my LinkedIn or a scan of the CX mm -hmm. webpage, or whether it's listening to five seconds of a podcast, but they're taking that information and then they're going over to a loom or a video or, or a video messaging solution uh, tool. Yeah. And I just think it's like, it's hard to ignore it, man. It's almost hard to yeah. ignore it. So like, I, it, it is, it's impossible to. And, and if you've, if you've ever been in that position before, like you said, you're almost compelled to respond at that point. And uh, yep. whether it's, yeah, I'm in for a meeting or it's just not for me, but great. Keep up the great work. You're going to have keep success. Up the good work. That's, that's good too. Yeah. Keep up the hustle. hundred yeah. percent. Yep. I love it. Yep. Um, before we jump off tools, Tony, while building Prosper Stack, and even just even in some of the past companies you helped to build, mm -hmm. if you were to kind of leave like one one major piece of advice or one or two major pieces of advices for our listeners that are building their own businesses and their own tool stacks, what's like the one or two things that you've learned about your whole experience with tools that you'd want everybody to be, to be thinking about and save them a little bit of time and save them a little bit of consternation on? Yeah. I think when you start evaluating tools, it's easy to, to get like analysis paralysis and just get caught up in like, well, this one does this and not this, but just, just dial it back and think, what are my core needs out of this tool for now? And as soon as you find one that, that meets your budget, that, that checks those boxes, don't get caught up in, yeah, but it doesn't do this. Well, that wasn't part of your core list anymore, right? So just focus on what is important to you and then make that evaluation process quick and make that decision fast because like the longer you take the the, the more it's hurting you by just not being able to leverage that tool just yet. So I just think the speed in which you do it and just being true to why you're actually getting that tool and what you need out of it, just stay true to that. And you'll find your solution quick. 
Love it, man. Love it. Um, let's dive into the third CX pillar of process. So, okay. This yeah. is an interesting one too, because you guys probably have spent a lot of time thinking about not just process, but workflow. You guys are literally helping companies and your customers thinking about mm -hmm. that last part of a journey where nobody wants to talk about it or get there, but it's the part of the journey where mm -hmm. they leave instead of renewing yeah. or uh, upselling or cross-selling or signing up for another contract. They're the, it's the departure stage. So, so I'd love to kind of hear how you and the team at Prosper Stack has kind of thought about building your own playbooks and building your own process. And then I'd love to, get, I'd love to kind of hear you talk a little bit about what are you guys learning from how your customers are building their processes or building their workflows or what maybe what they aren't doing. And that's where mm -hmm. you guys are kind of being able to slide in and, 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 and kind of provide a ton of value around how to get better at the whole mm -hmm. churn piece. Yeah. I mean, I think a big part of what we bring to the table when we start working with the customer is sort of like this built-in expertise around offboarding and the flows and what's working and what's not, especially when leveraging data from other companies we're working with. Now, yeah. we never share yeah. like, you know, this is the exact copy. This is specifically what it is, but we can consult with them and say, try this strategy, that strategy. because We've seen that this can have a higher uptick in, in acceptance, that kind of stuff. So those processes have been built, you know, from the get-go, like the very first thing we did while you know, we, the code was being written for Prosper Stacks launch was, you know, I think I literally went and canceled a hundred different services out there just to see what people were doing. And I documented like in a spreadsheet, here's the overall, here's the questions they asked, here's how many steps they had, here's the offers that I was presented or not presented. And we came up with what we just think is a best practice overall, which we include as like our default template in our product today. And then we customize it from there, you know, working with the, with the customer, but we give them Kind of like, hey, we've we've seen all the strategies. We know it works. We're, we're part of the value we're providing here is that consultative type relationship in there too. So that's one thing that we look at in, in the process that we build out, and and we do that um, when we onboard customers. We kind of have an, what we just call like a ninety day onboarding period where okay. we're meeting with them on a regular basis to evaluate what's working, what's not working, and then to make suggestions on different strategies to try in order yeah. to optimize. You know, not only for the right data collection and feedback, but also for retention. So. Okay. You know, a huge value of, of what we're adding to them to their bottom line is lifetime value. So it's, totally, it's a lot of times totally. it's really easy to look at what they're spending on us and what they're getting out of it. And that's a really cool thing um, at the end of the day, because not every product is, is that tangible um, in, in the results it gives. So, um, yeah, I mean, other than that, I think the I mean, I think that's kind of a big core part of how we we built our process. Yeah, I love it, man. I think a um, couple of things. Number one, even just like the idea of seeing how seeing how this part of a customer journey works across a number of different companies with a number of different industries plus plus I'm, I'm i'm thinking like the technology tony so like when during your exercise there when you went through canceling a hundred different things dude those are all wildly different sets of technology so like very much yeah maybe some of them are you know your netflix your amazon maybe some of them are your grocery type of services maybe some of them are like your, um, I don't know, some of, some, some of the information services that you pay a couple a couple bucks a month for to get newsletters, stuff like that. Like we've all got our own things that we're doing, but like that had to have been a super interesting exercise, <laughs> number one, obviously why, was, you know, why, was, why, yeah. why Prosper Stack is doing what it's doing today and helping a bunch of customers with this process. But the other thing too is it, it must've, what, what were like the two or three things that just jumped out at you that you saw right away, excellent companies and brands were doing? Versus maybe shit ones, ones that weren't doing a really yeah. good job with it, or where you could yeah. literally see they were letting millions of dollars flow right out of their right out of their website or right off of right out of their business. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing, the contrast in like a really big company and maybe like a smaller, more niche company doing it was just the investment they made into the offboarding process. And obviously, the more churn you have, the more customers exiting, the more retention and value you can get out of it. But the biggest takeaway for me was that I think only a couple out of the hundred I went through even tried to incentivize me to stay wow. or did anything in that moment to do that. Yeah, yeah. But the big ones, you know, like I think everyone knows at this point, you can go LinkedIn, you can go cancel sales nav and they're going to give you 50% off for some amount of time. Sure. So, you know, if you didn't know that, there's a little tip. There you go. That's a, <laughs> um, that's a huge win right yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think that, but the big companies have always traditionally figured this out, even not in a software model. When you think of more of like the call center model where you call in to cancel, maybe it's your cable subscription or your, you know, garbage disposal, whatever it is, they're going to try to incentivize you to stay. And this is just modernizing this. And, and I think there's a sliding scale too, right? You don't want to be so intrusive that you're making your customers upset because you, you know, if you want to be customer centric, you've got to do what's right, not only for your customers, but for their customers. So we, 
really encourage that, you know, it's, there's a fine line, there's a balance to be had here where you want to get feedback and useful data from your customers, but you can't put such a blocker up that they're going to be upset when trying to cancel us because you've got 14 steps to go through, right? So there's, there's that kind of hybrid there. And honestly, we've never had a complaint come through um, that an end user has been upset with the process because I think just in general, if they're allowed to self-cancel, number one, that's a great thing and, and they love that. Um, and they're always generally happy in, in, as long as it's not too interested to provide some of that information because at one point they were paying you money. They liked your company. They found value out of what you're doing and they're happy to share why they didn't do that anymore, whether it was that they're more upset because it was a service related issue or it was just, you know, a change in their business that, that covered it and they hope to come back at some point. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a good balance to have though. It's, it's, it's important to strike the right balance, I should say. I I, I totally agree. And I, I was also thinking what hearing you say that it makes me think about every single solitary one of us has been in a position working with a really large company or a really large brand where you feel handcuffed. You're trying to lead. It's not things went south. Things aren't going well. You don't have the type of service that you want. And it's a pain in the ass to try to cancel or it's a pain in the ass to try to um, either try to get your money back. And uh, in the modern world, nobody wants that. Nobody wants that with the brand. Nobody wants to deal with that with the business. And I think, I think yeah. modern business leaders, they get this. We understand it's like, if you can mitigate friction at all costs, if you can make even, even the worst case scenario, which is a customer churn, if you can make that frictionless, over time, man, you are creating an army of promoters and you're creating mm -hmm. a much smaller group of detractors who even if they didn't have a great experience with the brand, they're not going to talk talk negatively on, on the way out. So I, all, all awesome things there. One last thing um, that I want to pick your brain on it, because I think you, mm -hmm. you, you made me think about this, is like there's so, so many different ways of slicing and dicing how you can actually um, manage this, this departure feedback. So number one, and you guys do this really, you talk about this really, really nicely in the Prosper Stack content, but like analyzing and seeing everything in one place is one part of it. But mm -hmm. understanding the different customer segments is another part. Like a lot of companies, yeah. it takes them a while to get to the point where you even understand what what groups or what segments or what cohorts mm -hmm. of customers have the highest levels of departure. Um, and then the last part, man, it's the sentiment. I, I, I think one of the coolest things about your, your tool and the mm -hmm. product you guys are building is like, even smart companies have a hard time doing sentiment analysis. And even, even companies that have full-blown analyst teams and maybe a couple couple different people on CX, they're not necessarily super great at doing sentiment analysis or social listening. And I think the more help that tomorrow's companies can get with that, the better off they're going to be. Definitely. Yeah. So I think speaking to those couple points is, you know, it's the reason why companies don't do it or that they struggle with it is because it's hard, right? It's hard to find what segments you need to be looking at and how you slice and dice kind of how you usually are behaving. So we give them the tools to like, at, least, at the very minimum, get some really basic ones. Like most Subscription SaaS companies have a monthly plan and annual plan. So there's, you know, a couple segments right there is just your month to month customers versus your annual ones. And we give them the tools and the reports to filter them down and say, how are my monthly users churning versus my annual, right? And then we can get as, as complex as they grow and they really want to slice and dice them even further. We could say, well, now show me my monthly customers that are within their first 90 days of, of their life, life cycle. Um, a lot of companies find out like there's a, there's a tipping point. And if I can get them past 90 days, 180 days, whatever it is, they're going to be customers for life. So when you apply that thinking to offboarding and, and customer retention, you can basically be hyper aggressive with them in that early period. If they're not finding that value, because I'm a big believer, it's not that your product's not good. It's that somehow you didn't get them to that value point, that aha moment yet. And there's still a chance to get there. And if you have to use a temporary discount as a crutch to get them there. It's worth it because you know how much that customer is worth to you if you can get them past that point. So yeah, on the on the first thing there, the, the segments, we can do a whole bunch of stuff with that, but that's, that's a couple of basic examples of, of how we can do it. And then on the sentiment is really neat too, because yeah, we do over time show them trends about how their customers are feeling um, and um, towards that company when they're leaving. And what we do is we run the feedback that they give them through that sentiment analysis and and kind of score it so they can use it for remarketing efforts, right? They can say, you know, if people were generally happy with us, that means that they are likely to return. So we could put them in some sort of automated drip campaign, but they can also like, you know, point out negative feedback and people that were not happy and take a more hands-on one-on-one -on -one approach with them in order to solve that problem at that. Cause that, in that case, that calls for a little bit more. They're going to get upset if they get some, Hey, come back. Well, didn't you read what I wrote? It was, it was pretty bad. Yes. So you, they, that, that would be worth it to have a, you know, a one-on-one -on -one call or, 
an attempt to fix it there and understand it. So yeah, we we just give them we give everyone that information and they can leverage it however it's best for their organization. I love it, man. It, it, it's it's on one hand, it is like just awesome insights and awesome ideas and tips for how our listeners can be doing a much better job with their customer portfolio management, number one. And then number two, everything that you just said, Tony, I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, man, customer signaling all day long because you are spot on, man, where if you can figure mm-hmm. out some of the customer signals or some of the leading indicators for departure or some of the leading yep. activities or leading signals for churn, guess what? Once once you start seeing those signal those signals bouncing or popping on you, yeah, somebody's got to go do something or else you got to you got your next churn and you got your next dollar bill walking out the door. So I love that. Tony, let's jump into the fourth and the final CX pillar of feedback. And we've already started kind of talking about some awesome ideas around feedback, but mm-hmm. um what I'd love for you to spend a minute or two just talking about like number one, how have how has the Prosper Stack team evolved the way that you guys have collected your own customer feedback and like how you've gotten better and better and better at understanding what people want, what people don't want, what people will pay for, what they won't pay for. Um, and then I'd love to I'd love to have you spend a, a minute or two talking about how you get feedback from your team to continue to improve the product and improve the service. Talk about feedback. Yeah, yeah. Feedback is unique for us because we're obviously getting it from our own customers and then we're helping our customers get that amazing feedback from their own end users. So from our perspective, how we approach our customers, and a lot of it has to do with the processes that we've built, especially around onboarding and, and how hands-on we are, is that we have those, you know, a couple times a month with those early customers when they're trying to, you know, figure out how to best optimize their flow. They have ideas on things they want to enact. And we get just some amazing raw feedback. Being an early company, I try to be involved with as many of those conversations as I can up until this point. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm generally getting it directly from them, you know, just via Zoom, via Google Meet, whatever, whatever tools we're using at the time. Um, and that, that feedback is absolutely priceless. Like, I think we have a pretty good intuitive sense of what we want to build and how, and how we want to go about it. But the feedback helps us dictate the, the, the priority level of our roadmap, right? If I'm getting, I'm having these early customers and there are three things that I'm hearing are overlapping. Well, then I go work with Graham and we say, how can we prioritize this thing that's on our roadmap? Because this is what I'm hearing directly from the customers that we're onboarding right now. And uh, we, I think we do a pretty good job of, of leveraging that. Um, and then from like an employee growth perspective um, and how we're talking with our employees is, you know, I, we do run, you know, bi-weekly one-on-ones, you know, all of our processes right now are probably, you know, they're, they're pretty crude. We're not using some fancy tool to like survey them and get this there. We're small enough where we can just get it directly at this point, but we do bi-weekly one-on-ones, you know, the goals of the, are those is find out what's working, you know, why, why are you having some of the success you're having, you know, what's not working, where are you stumbling? And, you know, how can we as founders better support our employees to give them the best chance to succeed? I don't ever want them to like to feel like that we're not providing them something, whether it's a tool or just even support mechanism that is getting in the way of of them not being able to do their job to their fullest. So we try to, you know, evaluate that even on like as much as a biweekly basis, just a quick 15 minute chat uh, with each with each of them and and figure out how we can do better. I love it, man. I think. um... First of all, all awesome stuff. And then and then just second of all, you know, for our listeners, what Tony just said, embrace that one because it's on one hand, it's 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 getting good at understanding how to listen to your customers, respond to your customers, act for your customers, right? You're gonna get a ton of wins just by those those three things right there. But like like excellent companies and companies are really kind of figure out and unlock that key to growing and and scaling and and really beginning to bring down a whole lot more of the same type of success that they found at their early at baths. I would argue it's the EX side, it's the employee experience. So it's like balancing, okay, so from what we understand from our customers, hey, employees, let's vet this with you guys. You guys typically know Mm -hmm. these, you know these insights better than anyone. You've oftentimes worked really close with the customers on it. So, So there's like that triangulation of sort of, what's the customer saying? What's the employee saying? And how do we use those two things to improve our business, right? And I think for, yep. for tomorrow's business leaders that, that, that follow that simple approach, man, this stuff's gonna be a lot easier for you. And then lastly, you're gonna be building a culture and you're gonna be building a team and you're gonna be building a company that's a lot more fun to be a part of. So all awesome stuff there. Uh, Tony, yeah. before we wrap up, I wanna make sure, um, talk to us about, is there anything else going on with um, uh, Prosper Stack that you want the CX Nation to know about? Any any upcoming blogs or books or, 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 any, or any incentives or anything that you guys are pushing out there into the world that you want people to go check out and learn more about Prosper Stack? For sure. Yeah, we, we do post a fair amount of blog content and we talk about churn management as a whole and different strategies you can take. So it's very generalized to, you know, not just things Prosper Stack can help you with. So we have a lot of thoughts and opinions around that. Um, we have some really cool features that are coming up that, that I'm excited about. Um, stuff that really, 
brings personalization into the cancellation experience, things that we can, we can now like show very specific statistics to your customers as they cancel that show them how much value they've gotten out of your product over time. So like, you know, if you're a CRM, imagine you could say, well, hey, you've got, you know, 10,000 contacts in here right now, you've got 6,000 companies, you've been able to close this much dollars in, in deals through our product. Is this something you're really ready to step away from? Um, so to, again, just reiterating that value through there and, and some of our new features are, are getting, uh, are allow, allowing our customers to be hyper-personalized with their own users um, in, in really just a no-code environment. So that's, that's something there, you know, we love to chat with, you know, all subscription businesses, um, whether it's something you need from us right now or in the future, we're, we're happy to just chat with you and see if we can help you out around customer retention and, and offboarding. Love it, man. Well, I think I think it's awesome work that you guys are doing. There's no doubt about it. This is going to be a massive space in the future. So so kudos to you for building in this in this place. Um, and then last thing, where can people find out more about you, Tony? Or where, where can they get in touch with you or your team? And where can they find out more about Prosper Stack? Yeah, yeah. So um, website is prosperstack.com. Um, I am also, I love to connect with people on LinkedIn. So hop on LinkedIn, look me up, Tony Sternberg at Prosper Stack. Um, I, I do post a lot of content around this sort of subject as well and um, have some different opinions around some different strategies too. So um, if, you're, if you're into that kind of content, you want to be exposed to it, would love to connect um, and just learn more about what you're doing as well. I love it. Well, Tony, it's been our absolute pleasure having you on the CX Chronicles podcast. Thank you so much for the time and the energy. And uh, I'm going to look forward to keeping our conversation going offline, sir, in the future. Absolutely, Adrian. Thanks for having me. It's a blast. And uh, again, same here. Love, love, looking forward to having our conversation continue.